Hey everybody, I'm Steve. Uh, this talk is called The Return of Shoes. Uh, it's sort of a talk in three parts. And uh, if you don't know me personally, I tend to wear my heart on my sleeve. And so this talk means a lot to me. And the end of it is, uh, is a little personal. So I love you guys, but just get ready for that. So shoes. Shoes is a project, if you didn't know, that was originally written by Why the Lucky Stiff uh, when he left the Ruby community a couple years ago. Um, I decided to, uh, I wasn't sure if I was ready to help out with an open source project or not yet, so I said, I'll help out whoever picks Hackity Hack because I really believe in Hackity Hack's mission and I care a lot about Hackity Hack. Um, if you're not familiar, Hackity Hack is a, the largest shoes application and it's used to teach new people how to program in Ruby itself. Um, and then uh, 12 hours went by and everybody, pissed, you know, somebody said, I'll take over HBricot and I'll work on shoes and I'll work on, uh, you know, his other projects, but nobody stepped up for Hackity. And uh, I, I decided that uh, it, was, it was time to put my money where my mouth was and if I really did believe in it to continue working on it. And so um, by extension, by now, I'm also basically the developer of shoes as well since I'm using it as my dependency. Um, Hackity Hack and shoes are both, uh, you know, projects that I'm now taking over. So um, I'm giving this talk because I love shoes. And originally, I came to shoes through Hackity Hack. But actually, um, while Hackity Hack is great, and I really believe in the social mission, and I think that's really important, I think that shoes is really important for Ruby. And so um, I, I want to make sure that everybody knows about shoes and that it's still alive and what's going on with this project. So um, that's sort of what I came to share with you guys today. Uh, the first part of this talk is the tech demo. So what is shoes? Um, this is uh, something that I shamelessly stole from Wise book on shoes, uh, and it's called The 10 Gifts of Shoes. So this is a rundown of 10 features of shoes uh, itself. And like I said, it's from Wise book, Nobody Knows Shoes. Uh, one of the things that's really difficult about taking over someone else's project, especially after they're gone, is that you have to respect their vision and what they did while also making it your own. And so it took me a long time personally to be OK with using what Y built, but also calling it my work. You know, especially when you invest yourself emotionally in things like Y did, uh, it's, sort of, it's sort of wrong, right? Uh, to like, it, there's, there's, I struggled with this a lot. Um, and so this is, all of these images are done by Y, not by me, but I thought that, that was appropriate. So just to get that out of the way. So 10 features of shoes. Um, para, stacks and flows, buttons, images, edit line, links, Backgrounds, URLs, and clear. So it's the overview, top 10 things you need to know. Um, so shoes, like I said, GUI toolkit. So the most basic thing uh, is the paragraph. Um, this particular little bit of code uh, will actually create that particular uh, window with that paragraph on it. So the reason that I love shoes specifically as a GUI toolkit is because it uses the features of Ruby uh, differently. A lot of the other GUI toolkits are still stuck in the design from the, the 80s, where we said, like, let's build Qt, and let's build GTK, and they're all based on C. And so a lot of wrappers for uh, those toolkits still inherit the, you have to program Qt Ruby like you would program Qt in C++. And so Shoes is the only GUI toolkit that truly adopts Ruby. So it makes heavy use of blocks, um, because blocks are callbacks, and that's how a lot of good things for uh, UI code. So anyway, so para and a string will print paragraphs. Super simple. Um, stacks and flows are the way that you do layout. So a stack will make elements go from top to bottom, um, up and down. And flows make it go from left to right uh, inside of a flow. So combining these two elements, you can build pretty much any kind of GUI you want. There's, it's very heavily web-based. And actually, the original, uh, the original iteration of Shoes was an embedded uh, version of Gecko, if I recall my history correctly. And so uh, this might be familiar to you as like divs. Uh, it feels that kind of way. But this means that you can build GUIs uh, really simply, as opposed to the primitives other languages give you. Um, buttons are great. You say button and uh, a title, and then you pass in a block. And what happens in the block is what happens when the button is clicked. Couldn't be simpler. Um, and this also shows alert boxes, where it pops up an alert. You alert and give it a string. Um, Images are, this slide is full of images, but you can see right below the spaceship, it says image guy.ping, 
top 100, left 100. It's all you need to do to display an image in shoes is just give it the path to something, or you can actually give it a URL and it'll download and cache it locally, but it's all about being simple. And uh, to do a text box, you say edit line, and then you get a variable, and you can manipulate that variable later. So um, you can you know, pass clicks to images and things like that. Uh, if you want to go somewhere, um, you know, it'll open things in web browsers if you want to link to the web directly. And uh, one of the things that's really amazing to me from programming other GUI toolkits is why some limitations of backgrounds. So um, you can make backgrounds by giving it a color or a gradient or a picture if you want to change the background of a window that you have. And uh, it, again, adopting Ruby, uh, if you want to make a gradient as a background in shoes, then you just pass it some hex colors in, uh, you know, with a, the, the list uh, range, and it just does the gradient. Um, I was doing some QT work the other day to compare this, and so what would it be background hash FF to hash OO in shoes was 26 lines of QT Ruby, because you have to instantiate a gradient object, you have, to inst you have to say what percentages the gradients move and how much the depth is, and like all these crazy options that nobody really wants. You just want a gradient to be on your background. So uh, shoes does a lot of this kind of thing where it's whatever is the simplest possible thing, what would you want? And, and this is why I say it's very Ruby-like, because that's what drew me to Ruby originally. Um, when I show Ruby to other people that come from other programming languages, because I have a lot of programmer friends, um, they'll ask me how to do something, and I'll say, I'm not sure, but try doing this. And they're like, you're crazy. Why aren't you looking that up? And I'm like, I bet that's because that will work. And they're like, no. And then they try it, and it works. I'm like, how did you know that? Well, you know, we have a culture of doing what you would expect people to do in Ruby, and so shoes does what you would expect from Ruby as opposed to what you would expect from the C implementation of the binding of the library that you're you know, being exposed to. Um, she uses a really interesting concept called URLs. So you can actually map uh, the like, named paths to essentially screens. So this is a little tiny shoes application that displays a list of books. And so it has three primary screens. And the way that you would navigate through that is by mapping these URLs. And when people click on a link, they go to that URL. Again, sort of like taking some concepts from the web and moving them into desktop applications. Um, and this ends up being really simple. Uh, and one of the extensions I'm thinking about building for shoes in the future is full MVC, but that's another topic. Uh, and the last part, I guess, an example is clear. So you can manipulate objects sort of in a jQuery-like fashion by saying, you know, clear all the things in this flow and replace it with this stuff, or add things on to this stack and you know, or remove these things. And it sort of has those kind of selectors feel to it. So. Um, as, a, as a small little, I guess, demo of how this actually works, um, I should also mention building on top of other toolkits. So what Shoes does is it actually builds natively on the, tool, on the, the uh, GUI elements for each platform. So on Mac OS X, you get native Mac OS widgets. On Windows, you get native Windows widgets. On Linux, you get GTK, which is as close as to Linux native as you can get. But, um, so this is a, a slightly more feature complete Shoes app. We have a project called Shoes Contrib, where people share little shoes projects they made. And so we made a file browser that would let you browse through and run all of the little sub-shoes programs in, the, uh, in the, the project. So as you can see, we have a stack and a flow. Um, you choose a category by picking something from this list of uh, items in the, the list box. I wish I had better uh, code highlighting, but you know, Keynote and all that doesn't just do it for you. So, but then you have a, another box you can pick from. And whenever the category box changes, uh, it makes it visible and does a dir.glob glob to load all the RB files into that box. And then whenever the box changes, it evals the text in that, uh, in that RB file in the, the current context. Bam, your shoes app is running. So let me just show you this in action real quick to show you some of the fun things you can do. So here's the actual uh, browser running. So you can choose, so we can pick like art. And uh, I happen to like the mask. So you can see it like masks colors over this text or uh, a couple other good ones. You get a, a little gradient. Uh, it's sort of hard to see up on the projector. But anyway, it just lets you browse around with all these kind of fun kind of little, uh, little things. And you can do all sorts of stuff. So, um, but that's what you get is this is the actual shoes. This, that shoes code running looks like this. So native Mac OS X uh, you know, widgets and all that jazz. So um, nobody knows shoes, but now you do. Um, so that's the little, little high-level intro of what Shoes is about and uh, why it's, it's the first GUI toolkit that I did not hate using. Every, one of the reasons why I love doing web development is because building GUIs is such a pain. And Shoes is the first time that I ever developed a GUI where I didn't uh, 
want to uh, inflict pain upon myself and whoever made me do that GUI. Um, it comes with its own set of challenges as well. Getting used to doing things in a different way means learning different design patterns, and there's a bunch of other you know, things that are related. So it's not without, it's, it's not totally good all the time, but it's way better than, uh, than using wrappers for other libraries. So that's, that's why I love shoes. So what's awesome about shoes? Other than the fact that I just showed you, and so of course you're all gonna go start building desktop applications in Ruby, uh, what, what specifically is awesome about shoes? Um, as I just said, it's the first GUI toolkit I've ever used that doesn't suck. Um, it's fun to use, and it's, it's simple, and it's what you expect from Ruby as opposed to another language. Um, the beautiful thing about shoes is that it's an interface and not an implementation. So one of the other, um, the other main contributor to shoes actually has been spending the last year uh, writing uh, green shoes. Um, you can find it at that address on GitHub. So green shoes is a re-implementation of the shoes API in pure Ruby that binds directly to libgtk. And so um, the, the value in shoes uh, is not the code that Y wrote. Um, while that is valuable in the sense of history, the, the thing that makes shoes great is the interface. And so we actually are working on developing multiple sort of backends for shoes, and they all have slightly different features in the sense that like green shoes um, has some extra capabilities uh, that red shoes, which is what I'm calling the classic Y implementation, doesn't have. Um, but it's also missing some features that, that red shoes does have. But it still gives you that same general interface, and a lot of shoes applications just move right over from one to the other. So you know, if you like Qt and you want to use Qt Ruby in places, you might want to try out. I did a blue shoes as a tiny little port that did some of this stuff, but it lets you sort of leverage other toolkits as well and sort of mix and match things. But that's where the real value in shoes is: is the interface, um, because that's that's what makes it so magical. Um, now the nice thing about shoes is that it's right runs once run anywhere uh, in the sense that it is cross-platform. So if you're writing shoes applications, you get Mac, Windows, and Linux uh, just out of the box. And uh, it actually has a packaging system for the most part, uh, I'll get into that a little bit later, that lets you build exes, dot apps, and dot run files on Linux. So you get a native full application with everything that you need to, to build stuff. And you don't have to think about that. You just say, please package my shoes app. And it, and it just works. What is not awesome about shoes? Um, so uh, I've been up here talking about how shoes has been awesome for the last 12 minutes now. And uh, while there is a lot that's awesome about shoes, there's also a lot of things that are not awesome about shoes. And uh, I would be lying if I told you that everything is great in shoes land. So uh, in the interest of uh, transparency and to explain a little bit of what's going on, here's what's not awesome. Uh, the first thing that's not awesome about shoes, and this actually is the root cause of most of the rest of what is not awesome about shoes, is that at this point, two years later after Y leaves, I'm basically the only person that is still developing shoes. Um, like I said, the, the other core team member has been spending all of his time on writing green shoes, and while that's awesome and it's gotten a lot of people using it, and in the last month or so, we've started to see a little bit of development pick up again. Um, after Y left, the mailing list exploded with hundreds of emails of people uh, I want to help develop shoes. Let's talk about building on shoes. I want to do these things with shoes. And one by one, they all stopped posting. And one by one, they all went away. And uh, at this point, like I uh, am pretty much the only person that's doing core shoes development. And in the sense of patches, uh, I'm the only one that has patches in, in the last couple months. And uh, this is fine, but it causes these other sub problems that sort of occur. Um, the first one is the platforms issue. So when I just told you, you support all versions of Mac, Windows, Linux. Cool. Well, that actually means, when I say Mac, Windows, Linux, it means uh, Ubuntu Linux, and Fedora, and Arch Linux, and Windows XP, and Windows Vista, and Windows 7, and Mac OS Leopard, and Mac OS Snow Leopard, and now Mac OS Lion. And <laughs> I, I, I am late tired. Uh, it's just the process of making sure that regressions don't occur is incredibly difficult, and I need to know about the intricacies that happen on all of these platforms, and every six months, Apple is coming out with a new version of Mac OS, and I not only need to know about what changed in it, but know how it affects shoes, know how the GUI stuff changed, and figure out how to have six or seven OSs installed on various computers I own so that I can build shoes and test them against all of these different platforms. So, um, this is a big problem, and I'm taking some steps to address this in the near future. 
Um, one of the things I guess I didn't actually explicitly mention before, um, I just got off my last consulting contract uh, two weeks ago, and I'm basically, uh, I have a bunch of money in the bank, and I am doing nothing but shoes development until currently I'm good until December. So uh, I'll be working on fixing all of these things, uh, and I'll be putting into shoes like, like a full-time job because I care about it that much. But um, so one of the things I'm doing to address this, this particular problem with shoes is uh, helping other people's open source projects. One of the things that I love about doing open source and why I want to be doing it as much as possible is that I get to work on a wide variety of things. If you haven't heard about Travis CI yet, um, you will be soon. Uh, Travis is what, it, it's like GitHub for continuous integration servers. Um, and I mean that in an even more literal sense than, um, than even just an analogy. So to, to start getting your project building on Travis using their continuous integration system, you go to their website, you click sign in with GitHub, and it says, here's all your repositories. Which ones would you like us to continuously integrate? And you click the button, and it says, cool. Every time you check in, we'll build your stuff for you. Don't worry about it. That's it. No crazy setting up servers, no installing Java to get Jenkins going, no installing plugins. It all just transparently works. Um, you can add a doc Travis.yaml file to your project to configure some different options about which Rubies you want things to run on. Um, but Travis CI, as of the moment, it only supports Linux, basically. So one of the things I'll be doing is working with them to help them bring up Mac OS and Windows boxes so that I can build shoes on multiple platforms and see that I'm not breaking my own build. But it also means that the side effect of that uh, means that hopefully, I mean, licensing issues aside, which is something that's going to have to be worked on, hopefully that means that all of you will also be able to test all of your Ruby code on multiple platforms. And so this is why I love open source. It, uh, it lets us multiply our efforts to help as many people as possible. I can spend one hour coding open source software and save all of you three hours individually. So uh, the, guy, the guy who made reCAPTCHA, um, is, he went to Carnegie Mellon, and I'm from Pittsburgh. And so I've seen him t speak a couple times. And uh, one of the things that he said uh, about his own work, you know, reCAPTCHA saved spam from bidding on tons of websites. I mean, reCAPTCHA, while it's annoying to type them in, um, you know, it's, it's got that problem, I won't want to say largely solved, but it's definitely taken a big dent out of uh, spammy sort of comments. But the guy that reCAPTCHA has, that made reCAPTCHA has crippling self-doubt about it. And the reason that he does is he's like, okay, so, uh, People spend 30 seconds filling out my CAPTCHA. They do this once a day. There are 2 million websites using reCAPTCHA or whatever. That means I'm wasting 2 million times 30 seconds a day, which means I'm wasting 48 man hours or whatever, which means that I am effectively killing three people a year in terms of man at time lost. And, uh, so, so he's a brilliant dude, so he's working on a new project that will be similar, but using it towards constructive ends. But, so this, these sort of force, force multipliers are one of the reasons why I love open source and one of the reasons why you know, we, we're operating in an ecosystem, right? So helping other projects is awesome, and so working on shoes will also help me help other people, which will end up helping you, which is great, because you know, helping people is awesome. Um, the side effect of these sort of builds and the fact that I'm the only one developing stuff means that the releases are incredibly infrequent. So uh, Team Shoes put out a release of Shoes. Um, shoes 3 came out on Y Day last year. Um, if you don't remember when Y Day is, it's, on, uh, it's basically next week. So that means that we've put out one release in the last two years, and we don't have a release actually planned for this Y Day. So uh, infrequent releases are a problem that happens um, in the reverse, right? We talk about these problems from the other end. I want to introduce continuous integration into my project so that I can have a faster feature development, so that I can release more often, so that I can deliver more value to my customers. And you know, that happens in reverse, too. It's not just, it's not just a positive thing. It, you know, it goes the other way. So I see that kind of happening with shoes. Um, another downside of shoes is that it is mostly implemented in C currently. And I happen to think that C is awesome. But it turns out that apparently most Ruby developers don't think that shoes is, or not shoes, but don't think that C is awesome at all. So what's a benefit for me, uh, I'm like, yes, I can actually code in C sometimes. And I get to expose Ruby. And I love Ruby, and I love C, and I love programming both of them. So it's something that really attracts me. It's been very difficult to find people who, um, I've had some people say, like, I would love to help with shoes. Wait, I have to learn what RB stir 2 means? Yeah. 
Uh, I'm really busy with my kids. I, I can't contribute. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, and so, uh, you know, so this is something that's good and bad. Um, you know, it's, it's super interesting. It's taught me uh, more about how MRI works and more about uh, Ruby's source code and more about the CX, uh, CAPI and, and all these kinds of things. Um, I've learned so much because of the way that Shoes has been implemented and has caused me to, uh, to personally grow as a programmer. And I would like to see that happen for other people, but apparently they don't quite see it the same way. So this has an effect of, of driving people away from the project, which is one of these things that sort of builds up. Um, I've actually referred to working on, on Y's code as software archaeology. Um, I actually never met Y. Uh, I started getting into Ruby as, as right as he left, basically. And uh, he came to Pittsburgh to supposedly release Hack Hack 1.0. And I was out of town, and I missed him. And I was like, oh, I hear this really cool Rubyist is going to be in town. Um, and then I missed him. So uh, you know, it's sort of weird. But I feel, like, uh, I feel like I do know why, because I've been reading his code for so long that you, know, you can sort of see the this, this same path. right? Like, He's writing this code because he was learning how MRI worked from my understanding of reading mailing lists and stuff. And the reason that Shoes is largely implemented in C is because there's, there's a whole file in Shoes' source code actually called um, little bits of Ruby I've grown to love and uh, in, in Ruby.C, and it's a bunch of C functions that he wrote to uh, you know, help this stuff work. So anyway, this is kind of a tangent, but I guess I'm just saying that like, it's, it's really interesting what you can learn about somebody from reading their code. And uh, unfortunately, nobody wants to read C code, it seems. Um, another bad part about uh, working on shoes is that uh, when I tell people about why, I describe him as an artist whose medium was source code. Um, I, don't, I don't think that Y was a programmer. And um, one of the things that is divergent, I, I do see a lot of art in code. I'm actually giving several talks at other Ruby conferences in this fall called Code as Literature. And I think that there's a lot uh, of stuff going on there. But I see beauty in engineering. Um, I personally find code to be uh, beautiful when I can change it quickly and you know, make it move with requirements so that it does something else totally different later. I think the code is well factored is beautiful. I think that code that's well tested is beautiful. Every time automated tests have saved me from a subtle bug that I didn't notice would be gone, you know, I, I smile and I think this code is awesome. So um, Gregory Brown posted uh, a blog post a week or two ago and uh, talking about testing and, and mocking and stubbing and all these things related to testing. And, and, and somebody in the comments uh, posted something like, yeah, or Greg's, one of Greg's points was, I think that it's OK to not test all the time. And this is something you've heard over the last you know, day or two a couple of times, that like, maybe testing 100% of the time is not actually what we want to be doing. And uh, Greg was sort of echoing the sentiment. And someone responded in a comment and said, like, yeah, I think that Rubyists really need to learn from Y's example. I mean, Y hated automated testing, and he still made all this great code that did all these awesome things. And I, I did a Picard, like, ugh. And, uh, and I wrote this, and it was like, as someone who's now maintaining Y's code, please write some tests. And um, one of the things that's difficult about, about my goals of the project versus Y's goals of the project is it's not that Y's code is bad. His intentions of the project were something that are totally different than my intentions and where I'd like to see it go. I'd like to see shoes become the default way that people write GUI apps in Ruby. Um, you know, I'd like to never see people talk about Tickle TK again as much as some people do like it. Um, and that, that would be something I would love to see in the future. But in order for that to happen, shoes needs to be reliable. It needs to work all the time. It needs to not randomly crash. And uh, it needs to be not on Ruby 191, which is something I'll talk about in a second. But, uh, so I'm not trashing Wise code. We had different goals. And so I'm now struggling with uh, making code that was written for one purpose be written for a different purpose. And so, um, so it sort of makes me sad when people talk about, why is great, don't write tests. No, please, write some tests. Don't need to test all the time, but, but, but do some of it, because it does say, as I just alluded to, uh, shoes and Ruby are very intimately related with one another. Um, if you've noticed, uh, if you try to gem install shoes, it prints out a message that's like, <laughs> no, you have to go to the website and download it. Um, and the reason why is that uh, Y's envisioning of shoes was that it was a toolkit. It was an all-in-one um, thing. So shoes is actually more of a custom Ruby distribution than it is a project in Ruby. Um, 
when you, when you distribute shoes, it's actually an executable that contains a full copy of Ruby inside of itself and its own code, and it runs all of that. Um, and so one of the things that I'm struggling with really, really hard at the moment is that uh, 192 is just not happening. And like, let's not talk about 193 yet. Um, we moved shoes to Ruby 191, and, uh, and it worked. But for some reason, there's some situation where the build process is not including the encoding information properly. And so when I build shoes with Ruby 192, it doesn't actually work. And uh, you know, I've been putting in, I've probably put in a man week or two looking into just this issue. And it's important because, as we all know, Ruby 191 was a horrible, tragic mistake, or at least in retrospective. Now that we have 192, we can all say that Ruby 191 sucked. And uh, it's the threading model was one of the big things that changed between 191 and 192. And unfortunately, for some reason, shoes code under the threading model on Ruby 191 on Windows Vista and Windows 7 makes shoes just randomly crash every 15 or 20 minutes, sometimes. Not on my computer, of course, but on a bunch of my users' computers. And so I believe that moving to 192 would help fix a lot of these issues, or at least would be important. I mean, I'm the only one that I know that still uses Ruby 191 in any capacity. It's because of this. And uh, you know, I would really like to move it forward, but it's, it's difficult. And uh, it is making me learn a ton, but it is one of the challenges of doing this kind of project. And yeah, if you, uh, this whole packaging situation. So what Shoes does with Ruby is, um, say you have a dot app, right? I don't know if you know about Mac OS X and desktop applications, but a dot app is actually just a folder. And inside that folder is code that gets run. There's an XML file that says what thing needs to be run, and then it all happens. So what we actually do with Shoes is, we compile Ruby into a temporary directory and all the dependencies that are needed to do all these graphical stuff. Then we change the root over into the .app directory, rewrite all the, the dynamic libraries to point at all the ones inside the .app directory, give you know, a Ruby with a special custom startup function that runs the shoes, loading code, and all that stuff. And uh, you know, that's sort of how it works on the .app sense. And uh, it's the same thing, but in a slightly different way that each of the other platforms need in the other situation. And this is, this is an awesome feature because you're able to package up your own applications because you have this template and you can drop your code into it and it just works. But um, it also means that there's lots of challenges whenever uh, you know, Apple likes to change their internal stuff the way things work between releases. And so you know, there's, there's problems involving versioning. It's a big issue. So anyway, so I think 102 would help a lot. But I'm also suffering with Ruby itself. And um, because it was written as basically a giant custom Ruby distribution, Gemifying shoes is not actually a simple task. I spent probably three or four man days trying to gemify shoes, and I got to the point where uh, it works and it loads, but as soon as you try to use it, it seg faults, and I got really sick of typing GDB Ruby dash E, uh, you know, dash R shoes and a bunch of other stuff, and like using GDB to debug Ruby that's running your code is uh, difficult. So. <laughs> It's awesome. I, I love it, but it's also hard. So that's why it's awesome, actually. And one of the reasons why I enjoy it is because I enjoy difficult pro problems. So, um, so we're sort of this weird inflection point. One of the reasons I'm giving this talk is because you know it's been a little while, and I've been working on this myself. And the past is nobody knows shoes, and the past is why. And there's versus what, where I'm trying to take the project and how I'm moving things forward. Um, like I said, and so. Which is sort of this really weird point where I've been really reflective about a lot of different things, and uh, because there's you know there's the there's the past and there's the future, and we're we're in the present, and uh, you can tell that I'm pensive because I'm just sort of rambling at this point. It sounds like, but this plays into a lot of other things. So I think about wh how we got from where we were to where we are now, and uh, you know it makes me think a lot about why did why leave, and you know why did all these things happen, um, and it's it's sort of funny. Uh, this, this was said earlier in the conference. I can die happy when I go to a Ruby conference and I don't hear anyone say Zed Shaw or why. Uh, and this has sort of a little bit of an element of, I feel like people leave the Ruby community and we do see ourselves as a community. And it, it reminds me of, uh, I was engaged once and uh, she broke up with me for one of my friends and it's, uh, it's OK years later, but every once in a while, you still have that like pang of, well, you know, what could have things been? And I feel like this is the way that we are with the heroes who have left our programming community. We, we, we constantly are dredging up these people that left us for some reason. And uh, I don't really know why that is. Like, why do we keep talking about Zed? He hates us. 
<laughs> why, why do we keep talking about why? He left and he never got in touch with anyone or contacted anyone, like he's gone. And so like I said, I never met why, um, and I've actually been talking to Zed about this. And uh, for, for reference, here's the scoreboard from this conference so far, not counting my talk. Uh, I've heard why twice and Zed five different times. Um, so it does happen, um, you know. So, so I've been thinking a lot about community and, and why we have people leave and why do we consider ourselves as a community because part of the thing with shoes and part of the things with Hacky Hack is that I'm minting new programmers and I'm introducing them into the Ruby community. Um, I've had one or two students pick up Hackity Hack. I have a, ki a kid who's like, uh, he's nine or 10 and he learned Ruby from reading Hackity Hack. I pointed him towards the pointed guide and the pickaxe and he started reading it. And he actually got to the point where he's contributed two patches back to the Ruby or to the Hackity Hack website now after going through, I don't know anything from programming and, that, and that's awesome and it's, it is great. And when every time I get an email from people that say like, I'm teaching my seven year old kid how to program with Hackity Hack, uh, you know, I smile and I'm like, okay, those man weeks I spent fixing bugs in GDB Ruby, like that's what it's all, that's all worth it, right? But I, uh, I have concerns about, you know, so the, one of the reasons that I, uh, I'm never going to have kids, and of course, you know, oh yeah, I'm 25, so I'll probably, you know, someday I'll be at Ruby conferences with uh, children, and everybody make fun of me for saying this, but one of the reasons why I don't want to have kids is uh, I have concerns about bringing a child into a world that I don't agree with what's going on. So, um, so there's sort of ethical concerns whenever you create life of what situation you're bringing that life into. And so as I meet new programmers, um, I, I have concerns that if I'm introducing them to a community that is uh, dysfunctional, that I'm doing them a disservice. And I'm not saying that Ruby as a community is dysfunctional. Um, I'm just saying that I love you guys, and uh, I don't know why we act the way we do sometimes. This, this manifested uh, yesterday. I wrote a blog post, um, and one of the sections is called All My Heroes Are Dying. And uh, I realized yesterday uh, morning, actually, I had to rewrite like, the second half of this presentation because of all this stuff, that basically, um, if I had to pick a programming dream team, like give me five programmers to build something, who am I going to pick? Here's my list. Zed Shaw, Y, Yehuda Katz, Aaron Patterson, and Wayne Seguin. Um, these are the people that I respect most as programmers. And the reason that I do is because all of them are incredibly prolific. They're all incredibly dedicated to open source, and they wrote code that, that saves me time and hours, and I use their code to this day. I mean, you know, Zed's uh, mongrel parser is in every deployment of every Rails app that I use Unicorn for, you know, now. Um, I'm working on wise code all the time. Rails and Yehuda and, you know, Aaron and Wayne's RVM project to save me effort. But since we're talking about scorecards here, let's go over the scorecard of the Ruby community versus my programming heroes. Zed. <laughs> We, we all know everything about Zed and Zed leaving, so he's gone. Why? Again, same thing. Those last two tweets he sent uh, <coughs> always really bothered me, you know, talking about we build things and then we throw them away and the flavor of the month takes over what, you know, you spent hours of your life making. And like I said, I can only speculate as to why Y left because I never knew him, but I think about it a lot. And uh, Yehuda. He left for Sprout Core. He's still around Ruby, and he didn't explicitly quit Ruby, but he's still not, like, this community is not where his heart is anymore. He's in JavaScript. Aaron, uh, I see Aaron posting emails to the Ruby on Rails core mailing list saying, guys, releasing, Ruby, releasing Rails all the time is killing me. I watch him do all this work, and I see somebody who's in the process of burning himself out. And I'm wondering, when are we going to lose Aaron? I mean, when we lost Y, people were sort of saying, like, Aaron's going to pick up the torch to that wacky Rubyist guy. And you know, he's had a lot of pressure on him. And if you didn't hear the news as of yesterday, I hate to bring up Twitter drama, Ruby drama stuff, but Wayne announced yesterday that he's not working on RVM anymore. Um, it's, it's gone. Uh, and the reason is that uh, Sam S. Stevenson from 37 Signals released a project called RBENV that basically uh, said like, RVM sucks because of all this stuff that's actually untrue, and so this is why you use RV, uh, RBENV instead. And um, so we're like in very, very close danger. I mean, Wayne may come back, but like, I, uh, I looked at this pattern and I realized this, and I was like, why, why are all my heroes going away? Uh, and I wrote a blog post about it, because that's what we do on Ruby. We get on Twitter and we write blog posts and stuff um, called We Forget That Open Source is Made of People. And um, when I talked to Zed about this, he actually told me that he's confused that we identify as X programmers in general. Like, 
he's like, from my era, you know, we were programmers and we happened to use some tools, but we didn't put it, like wrap up our identity into these tools the way that we do now. And we talk about ourselves as Rubyists and we talk about ourselves as Python developers and we develop these camps and we wrap up our identity in our tools. And um, I wonder why I feel this way so strongly about Ruby. Um, and I think that the thing is that the Ruby community is a community because we enjoy the playfulness and disruptiveness that Ruby brings to the table. I mean, at least that's why I did, right? Like, Java sucks because there's tons of, you know, uh, static typing and lots of factory implementations and all these craziness. And, like, you know, I'm just, you know, monkey patching whatever I want. And it just works. And this is awesome. And, and that's all great and stuff. But one of the ways that the, the disruptive communities disrupt the status quo uh, that statement in and of itself implies that there is a status quo and there is a disruptor and that those two camps are separate. And so the, the foundation that we sort of build that community upon creates these, this divisiveness. Um, and this is actually explicitly in, I, I forgot to put it in a slide, but in Getting Real, 37 Signals says, pick an enemy. And that that's a strategy for going about, you know, you need to, to create an enemy and build what's you know, going to destroy them. And that's that's great, and it's totally valid. And I mean, I did a startup. Like, I'm all about uh, hearing the lamentations of your women or whatever. Uh, <laughs> but at the same time, we have a community of people who are disruptive by nature. And uh, eventually, they start to disrupt each other instead of whatever we're trying to disrupt. So um, we forget that open source is made of people. Like, there are actual people who have thoughts and feelings and uh, hearts that are behind every open source project we use. And every time we trash someone's project or every time that we talk trash on another language, we are uh, talking trash on a person. And I think that this is something that we're so used to dealing with abstractions as programmers that we abstract away the human element out of programming and out of our communities. And so um, after this sort of blew up on Twitter yesterday, as Stevenson said, why do open source programmers take things so personally? And Yehuda responded with, because we're all persons. And it's very simple, but I think that this really captures the, the, tr the true root of the cause. We would like to think that programming is a meritocracy and that, you know, I mean, well, you built uh, a steam engine and I built a, built a car. So, you know, sorry, buddy, you're out of business. Like, we're all friends, right? I mean, I just, you know, made you lose your job and now your kids are hungry, but we're, you know, we just build a better, you know, better wheel. Like, it's cool. and and. I'm not saying that building new cars is bad, but we have to be thinkful about, we have to be thoughtful about the people that we're disrupting when we do it. And uh, Yehuda also has this to say back to me. Um, he said, that post made me sad because you vocalized something I've been trying to write for a long time. I haven't given up on open source or on Ruby, but the Ruby community is a harsh mistress. And, um, you know, this, this just makes me wonder, like, what kind of community are we building for our programmer children in the future? And is there something that is about Ruby that causes this? Is it the people that are involved? Are we doing the wrong thing? Is this inevitable? I, I don't really have any answers, but um, I, would like, I would like to start focusing on the positive ends of these kinds of things. So for example, Y Day. Um, I think Y Day is a great way to remember why and what he brought to the table. I don't want to harp on why all the time. And in fact, this is probably the last time, other than when I give this talk at RubyConf, that you'll ever hear me talk about why publicly, because I think that why wanted to leave, and so we should let him leave, and we should like let it go on. But on Y Day, uh, we should remember that Y, you know, had this healthy, playful attitude towards programming and doing it for fun and code is art and all those kinds of things. And I think that's valuable and we need to not forget that. And so I plan on keeping Y Day alive. Even if the website still says 2010, um, you know, I'll be celebrating Y Day um, and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. And so I think that that's a really positive thing that we can do to help, you know, encourage the good parts of our communities and not the bad. But fundamentally, what we have to remember is, that we're all people, even PHP developers. <laughs> and so while disrupting other communities is fine, and while I'm saying like we need to treat other Rubyists better because you know we're all family, uh, at the same time, like PHP developers should also be family. We're all programmers. You can expand this bubble over and over again. And so while it's good to, to innovate technically, we shouldn't forget the human element. Even when we're saying other people's stuff sucks. Um, there needs to be a whole lot more of this. Uh, and this is the one reason that I really like what Aaron does is like, you know, good morning, everybody. Let's have some coffee. Heart, 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 right? Like the, the community should be working towards uh, a lot more hearts and a lot less of, you know, there's someone is wrong on the internet and I need to personally fix it.
And so that's the, that's the Ruby community that I would be like to be bringing new programmers into via Hackaday Hack and Shoes. And that's the Ruby community that I would like to be continuing to work with. Um, we do a good job of this sometimes. So Ruby loves Node.js, right? Like I've heard people say uh, before that like Node is sort of a Ruby community almost. And Node is the next Ruby community. And this is their disruptive. But I mean, how many JavaScript talks have you gone to at this conference already? You know, a lot. And so I think this is a great way that we are inclusive of other communities. And we're not trying to say, like, Node is very different than Ruby in the same way that Ruby is very different from PHP. Yet we are respectful of the way that Node people are doing stuff. And we're incorporating their good work into our own work. And a lot of people that are good in the Ruby community are also good in the Node community, right? I mean, Jeremy Ashkenaz was a Rubyist. And now he's doing a lot of Node work. And uh, Yehuda is now in the JavaScript world more than the Ruby world. but. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's not harmful. It's a positive, symbiotic relationship. And, and that's really what we should be looking to cultivate. Um, this, this also is really exemplified in Ruby versus Python, right? Like, we're almost identical. We should be working together. We shouldn't be hating each other. As much as I do trash, talk trash on Python sometimes, I'm trying to not do so because, you know, I think that we should, we should be working to have this kind of relationship. This is what I want to see us have with other people in the future is, Sweet, that code you wrote is awesome. I'm going to steal some of it. High five. Let's get stuff done. So uh, thanks for uh, listening to me talk about this stuff. Uh, I have uh, multiple Twitter handles for all this stuff or uh, our status if you're a cool kid and use all my projects. You can find me on the web at my website or the shoes website or the Hackadag website. And uh, I'm writing a book on a t totally unrelated topic. You've got to get the plug in at the last minute. So uh, I'll be giving a lightning talk about it here. And, and uh, it's called Get Some Rest. Get some re.st. Everything you know about REST and developing RESTful APIs is totally wrong, and we could be doing a lot better. And so uh, I'll be talking more about that later, but I just wanted to plug that real quick. So uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for listening to me, and hopefully we can build you know, great communities in the future. And uh, as the other core contributor says, let's all have fun with shoes. Thanks.